The oil system on a lot of centrifugals can be a very challenging subject for a lot of guys, and it's rightfully so. You know, there's a lot of complexity to it when you look at it from an external perspective and you're just saying, oh, what the heck is all this? Well, I'm gonna walk you through what these things are and what they do and what are some critical things you need to be paying attention to. The oil system in any centrifugal is just as important as the refrigerant or anything else in the system. Ultimately, you're gonna have an oil sump. Now this is a YK machine and I'll be specifically speaking towards the York side of this. It all begins with the oil sump. So this is what the inside of the sump looks like. You have your oil heater and this particular machine also has the eductor in the back. I'll explain more of what that does in a bit. But the sump is where the oil gets stored and contained and it is allowed to drain back into from the compressor side of it. Now one thing that is very critical and a basic principle to understand is you want the oil to mix with the refrigerant as little as possible and we take a lot of measures to try to prevent the oil and refrigerant from not only mixing but staying together to where the oil begins to accumulate elsewhere. This is the front plate of the oil assembly. You see that you have a sight glass. This is the oil pump discharge side of the valve. This would be your sump or tank pressure. And this would be just a drain port with the temperature. This is your actual oil pump itself. Your motor leads come in. They tie in through the refrigerant seal. We'll have the uh, VSD for the oil pump tie into the, the spades on this side of it. This is where we're gonna keep the oil level and we are definitely below that. So as crazy as it may sound, this pump assembly does stay submerged and it would need to. Ultimately, the pump has a suction port down here towards the bottom. And this is a rotary style uh, pump with a discharge coming out of the center and then pushes out through the hose. Spins the outer ring and as it does, it creates a rotary style compression down here on this end of it. This is where it's going to be sucking in more oil. And as it rolls around and compresses, it's going to be pushing it through into a chamber on the end plate. We go into our discharge hose, which then feeds through this brace plate heat exchanger. Now there's nothing special about this heat exchanger. It is just a basic brace plate. It has uh, compression style fittings with uh, o-rings in them to seal through the cooler and then back out and then into our oil filter through the filter we come back to the top end of the compressor now back over here that is your oil pressure transducer it is that transducer and the transducer on the front of that end plate that is looking for oil pressure differential which we'll talk more about in a bit from here there is a set of chambers inside of this compressor that the oil is draining down through so on very top, you have a reservoir, and then from there, the system pressurizes and feeds oil through a set of journal bearings, and then through those bearings back out into the oil drain. And then this drain feeds back into the oil sump. From the sump, it just gets recirculated from there. Now there's a lot more happening here than just, you know, the fact that it cycles through here and drains. For example, why do we need this component to begin with? So we have multiple ways of maintaining oil temperature and it is very necessary to maintain a specific temperature range so that we can maintain a set viscosity. You know, as oil gets colder, it gets thicker and the viscosity increases. So by keeping that set range, we're able to make sure that the oil can flow properly. To do that, we have our standard oil heater, but then on the other side of that is sometimes that oil can start to run hot. And so we have a oil cooler here. On this brace plate, the oil circuit is not actually mixing with the refrigerant cooling circuit. So these are two separate circuits internal to here. So we have a line coming off of our liquid line and it has this little uh, AXV style uh, metering valve or just pressure regulator. And all it's doing is it's got a sensing bulb reading temperature of the oil uh, leaving the cooler and it's making sure that that temperature doesn't get too hot. So the hotter it gets, the more it warms this bulb up, the more it opens the flow up on this oil valve and it's going to push more refrigerant to cool that oil back down. This line is just going back into the evaporator and pulling back a suction gas from there. Now we have things called journal bearings and those journal bearings are almost like a sleeve bearing except they have kind of a lift process. So when we talk like a magnetic bearing machine, we, you know, we talk about it that the uh, bearings lift or have a la levitation of the shaft. Well, with a journal bearing, you also have a levitation type effect happening. You don't actually want the aluminum bearing housing to make contact with the steel shaft. That steel shaft will destroy that, that aluminum bearing. 
but by injecting oil into it and creating pressure, we'll have like two oil injection ports at the bottom. We're able to actually create a full oil seal around it to where that oil is quite literally lifting up on the shaft and positioning it evenly in the bearing. And so the journal itself, its main function is to help direct and control the oil flow more than anything. And the oil becomes the actual rotating race of the bearing surface, if you want to think of it in a like a, a ball bearing context. We have a VSD for our pump, and I'll talk more about that later. But this panel is monitoring the oil temperature and it's making sure that the oil stays within the conditions we need. So it is able to activate the oil heater. This is our oil transducer. So that is the high side pressure or the discharge pressure side. Talking about the oil filter a little bit, you know, York has gone through a few iterations of the, one, their recommendations on how they want you to treat these, but also they don't even use the same style. So this would be like a uh, cartridge style where there's an actual filter inside of here and there's an o-ring that seals on this if you ever take these apart if you ever change it make sure you replace that o-ring because this will leak and those o-rings are not meant to be unseated and reseated multiple times the newer style has like a uh, canister style that's that threads on much like a car filter would do now in the mix of york's multiple iterations of what they recommend at this point they recommend just change that oil filter as you need to. That is the most recent standard as of 2022 that I'm aware of. Uh, I will verify that in making this video. So if that changes, I'll put something on the screen here. But they've gone through a process where, you know, it was change it annually, change it every five years, change it this, change it that, you know. And, and they've also done similar things with like their uh, motor VSD assembly recommendations where they used to have us change the inhibitor coolant on various intervals, right? Anyway, the point is always double check, make sure you're up to date with the most recent standards that York is recommending and the series of chiller that you're doing. But right now their most current standard is uh, change that filter on, on an as needed basis. And there's a few ways of trying to verify when as needed really is needed. The two most simplest recommendations is either gonna come down to pressure drop across the filter. So you can check that. Obviously you have two valves here where you can check it. And you can also isolate and change this filter without having to do a complete recovery on the system, which is pretty nice. The other alternative is honestly, just whenever you have to do an overhaul or say you're doing a major service. If you ever do an oil change though, or if you change the filter specifically, some things you're really, really, really needing to pay attention to is make sure that the uh, there's no shavings or you don't see any metal fragments or you know, you're just really paying attention to any kind of debris or particles that are in that oil. Uh, you can see that with your hand a lot of the time. And if you're doing oil analysis or and you are changing this filter at any point, it is always really wise to take a piece of that filter and cut it out, uh, if, it po if possible, and send that in with the oil sample so that they can take and analyze that filter material and that'll help tell you if that filter material is catching any kind of particles or anything. Uh, if you start seeing a lot of zinc or aluminum or anything of that nature, then you really have a lot of reason for concern. We've talked about the oil sump or tank. We've talked about the cooler, the heater, and the general flow of where the oil is going. But some other things we need to discuss would be the, uh, this is your vapor vent pulling off of the tank. Being the fact this is exposed to refrigerant, you're gonna have some ex refrigerant exposure just in general. And we really don't want that refrigerant stacking that makes this tank higher than our evaporator side of the system. So this tank should be in a lower pressure state. And one of the ways we're able to do that is one, we pull the vapor directly into the, uh, the suction nose of the compressor so that it constantly has direct pull. This helps keep any flashing vapors or anything that is in the oil pulled off of the tank. The other side of that is as the oil pump itself is constantly drawing down, that helps maintain a lower pressure on this tank assembly. And so if you actually take and look at the sump pressure and compare it to your evaporator, the sump pressure will be slightly less pressure, which goes a really long way in helping in your oil return process and its ability to come back through the drain port here 
and everything get back into the sump where it needs to be and where you want to keep it. Earlier I talked about a eductor. Now what the heck is that? Well that was that big silver thing that's in the back back there. And essentially what it is, is it's a type of siphoning device. To make it work, if we're drawing discharge gas into this side of it. This is coming straight off of the uh, top of the condenser. And then we're also pulling straight off of the suction end of the compressor where the uh, nose cone is. And then this line here with the valve is coming off of the evaporator. And what these three are able to do is create a siphoning effect, one of which that I'm, I'm not a, enough of an expert on to properly explain it without getting myself confused. But the, the end result we're trying to seek here is that the oil that is able to get trapped down into the evaporator, we're able to draw that oil out. And that's where this siphoning has its place. So by siphoning off of this line, and we can control the flow of that through this valve, we're able to collect the oil that would be able to stack into the evaporator back into the sump. Because part of what will happen, if too much oil collects in the evaporator, it leads to a place where you can't properly heat exchange. And it's just like, you know, oil collecting in any uh, heat exchanger or specifically evaporator. If it uh, stacks in your regular split system evap and you can't get it back out properly, it becomes an insulator and you can't properly, you know, exchange heat, which is gonna affect your saturation, your approach temps, everything is thrown off because of that oil. So it is extremely critical in a system like this that we really control that and mitigate that. So we are able to do that by using devices like eductors to help siphon that oil back off of that refrigerant because it's really difficult to get that oil back out of the evaporator. Just to give you another good shot of that eductor assembly so you got a better idea of what it looks like. Now there's something else I want to point out. You see this little flap right here. That flap is a means of directing the refrigerant flow. So that is the suction coming off of the compressor. So what we're trying to achieve here is we want to pull any vapors back up through this way and pull them, allow them to go back into the compressor. But what we also don't want to do, we don't want our drain line back there to kind of turn into a straight bypass effect where it's able to pull so hard through this line that we end up sucking a little bit of that oil back into the suction of the compressor. Now let's talk a little more about the actual speed control of this and why it's even necessary. So before they started implementing variable speed control, all you had was just a pressure regulating valve that controlled the oil pressure flow through the system. And that valve had to be adjusted, calibrated, had failures, all the stuff. Now they implemented this and they did away with that pressure regulator, so now the VFD or the VSD for the oil pump is what purely controls the uh, oil pressure differential between the sump and the uh, top of the compressor. So on the oil management screen, if we had the thing powered up at the moment, you would see where it was calculating the pressure differential. And ultimately what it's trying to achieve is a 35 PSI D. That means that between the sump pressure and the oil discharge pressure up top, it wants to maintain a 35 pressure differential in order to make sure that you have adequate flow through the journal bearings and the compressor has everything it needs to function properly. Now, if you're doing regular PMs on a system, you should have a baseline of what you normally see on that machine. So if I have a machine that, you know, you know, over the last several years has run 40 hertz on my oil pump, and now I'm starting to see 45, 48 hertz, I'm gonna start asking questions of why am I running a higher speed at this point? You know, has something changed in the system? Am I struggling to maintain proper temperature? Because that can affect differential in the speed. So if the journal bearings inside the compressor begin to wear down, that's gonna make it harder to maintain differential. So that could be an early warning sign that you have a bearing problem. And if you change the oil filter out, which would be a logical step, you know, say that oil filter was starting to get a uh, higher pressure differential across it. Well, then you could change it out, but then the question becomes, well, why did it need to be changed out to begin with? So you should have that tested. And if you see that tested and you see a lot of aluminum come back from that, then you have a lot of reason for concern that those bearings are an issue. So these are all the little things that you can pay attention to that are gonna affect what speed that pump runs. And so that speed can tell you a lot, especially if it does have a solid baseline that you're able to go off of and it's a machine you're familiar with. Now, if it's a machine I don't know very well or I've only recently started working on it, 
then as long as I'm below 50 hertz across the board, I'm usually pretty happy. And if I see that I'm above 50 hertz on that speed, then I'm, that's when I really want to start asking questions. And it is possible, you know, there are maybe machines out there that run higher than that. I'm just stating in my experience, most of them that I work on on a routine basis never require that. So that's just a very basic rundown of some of the essential principles of this oil system. This isn't everything, like this isn't a complete expert overview of every little piece, but part of my goal is I want to get you a better visual understanding of what it is and I try to explain this to you along the way. You really should value the oil side of it just as much as you do anything else and you really need to pay attention to it, especially when you're doing any kind of troubleshooting because a lot of problems can show symptoms in the oil or there's a lot of symptoms that are related to oil problems. For example, you know, something that I didn't really bring up, but you see that there's a catch bottle down there on the bottom of that, uh, of the uh, open air housing for the coupling for the motor and the compressor. That catch bottle is an indicator of the refrigerant seal uh, for the shaft seal is what I mean. The shaft seal, so if that bottle starts filling up routinely, you know, that's an indicator that there's a leak and, uh, on the oil side of the system or the shaft, technically. So if, if that oil is going to collect there in that bottle. So there's lots of things that can be solid indicators and that knowing the oil side of this can really be a benefit and a tool for you to use. So I would just, I would, I, my challenge is don't overlook it and don't be scared to understand it because if you really want to develop yourself on these types of machines, you need a very solid foundation as to how the oil side of these things work and what you can do to utilize that data to help you out in the long run. With that, I'll close it out. MTT guys, I really appreciate it.